Thank you, Ian. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the presentation. If I lose my voice uh, at a point, it's because my daughter, who's three, drags along every virus she can, and she's obviously given it to me, so <laughs> I'm really, really sorry if that happens. Um, so my name is Yasmin, I'm from Copenhagen, and first of all, I need to tell you guys we have no disclosures. We funded the study on ourselves, that is, we conducted it in our spare time. So the title of my study, as Ian said, is Urinary Incontinence Before and After Pop Surgery. It's a database study. And the, the title basically describes the aim pretty well. We just wanted to look into symptoms of urinary incontinence in women undergoing pop surgery. But we also wanted to see if we could find any factor that would sort of predict the likelihood of her becoming continent after surgery. So we looked at their preoperative ICIQ total score, type of pop surgery, that is, which compartment was involved in surgery. We looked at the patient's preoperative pop Q stage, their age, and BMI. So to do this, we use the DugaBase. It is a national database in Denmark, the urogynecological database in Denmark, where registration of any urogynecological procedure performed is mandatory. So this ensures high validity and a whole lot of data. We included women with POP and urinary incontinence, and they underwent primary POP surgery. So they were not allowed to have any history of POP surgeries, any history of uh, incontinence surgeries, no hysterectomies, and obviously they were not allowed to undergo concomitant incontinence surgery at the time of POP surgery as well. We included women from the years of 2013 to 16 for this study. And any clinic that had a minimum of 75% response rate for both their preoperative and postoperative ICIQ urinary incontinence short form were included for our study. So the women came in for their pre-op assessment, filled out this form, and then postoperatively they were evaluated again. We ended up with 1,657 women. Using their ICIQ, ICI, ICIQ urine incontinence short form, we divided them into three groups preoperatively. So our first group had stress urinary incontinence, and uh, there were 32% of them. 28% had urgency urinary incontinence, and finally, 40% had mixed urinary incontinence. So let's look at how they did. So these are the results after surgery, pop surgery alone. For those who had preoperative stress incontinence, 52% were continent after pop surgery. For those who had urgency urinary incontinence, 60% were continent after pop surgery alone. And finally, the mixed group, 38% were continent after pop surgery. The differences between the three numbers are statistically significant. So significantly more women with um, urgency urinary incontinence were actually continent after surgery. So what about those factors that I mentioned before? Oh, I'm sorry, I was just gonna tell you about the worsening as well. Some of the women did do worse after uh, surgery. 8% of the women with stress urinary incontinence experienced worsening in their symptoms. 4% in the urgency group experienced worsening, and finally, 5% of the mixed group did have a worsening of symptoms. So let's look at the factors. So we looked at the preoperative ICIQ total score. We looked at type of pop surgery, that is, which compartment is involved. We looked at um, preoperative pop Q stage, age, and BMI. So for the stress group, we found that a low preoperative ICIQ total score increases the likelihood of becoming continent after pop surgery with an odds ratio of 1.7. But that was the only factor that mattered here. For the urgency group, we found that again, a low preoperative ICIQ total score 
score increased the likelihood of becoming continent after surgery with an odds ratio of 3.7. But for these women, type of pop surgery mattered as well. So if they had surgery in the anterior compartment or in the anterior and posterior compartment combined, they had an odds ratio of up to 3.3 of becoming continent after pop surgery alone. For the mixed group, we again found that a low preoperative ICIQ total score increased the likelihood of becoming continent, but for these women, POPQ stage mattered as well. So if a woman had a POPQ stage of three or four, she had an odds ratio of 1.5 of becoming continent. In conclusion, the chances of becoming continent after pop surgery alone really depends on what type of urinary incontinence you have before going into surgery. And we definitely see that women with urgency urinary incontinence has, have a significantly higher chance of becoming continent after pop surgery alone. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Yasmin, for an interesting presentation. Uh, it's now open to discussion, and there are microphones in the front here if you would like to come forward to uh, put forward your questions. Um, everybody seems to be rather sleepy this morning. Uh, or or they're just happy. <laughs> perhaps I'm, I'm already awake. Um, this was interesting. You mentioned BMI and age. Um, you, you didn't relate to that in your presentation. What about BMI and the con connection between the different types of incontinence? Um, you can have confounding factors. I'm interested to know if BMI, it could be related to both answering uh, to uh, different types of incontinence. So the reason why I didn't mention it is because we didn't find an association. So we've performed um, logistic regression analysis, obviously multivariate, and definitely checking if BMI and age, for instance, were confounding factors. And they were not. And we were quite surprised as well. And what about age? The same for age. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yes, De Leo of the Netherlands. Thank you for the nice presentation and beautiful study. Can you tell us how many women dropped out who were eventually eligible for this study, but who dropped out because of the lower response rate for the questionnaires? So, so as I mentioned before, a clinic was only rolled in if they had a minimum 75% response rate, right? And those were the only data we looked at. So I can't tell you how many women dropped out, but to try and avoid that selection bias, because we were worried about if we would, you know, be bi if the results were biased, uh, we decided that if a clinic has a 75% response rate, we're trying to sort of circumvent that bias. But I can't, we, I mean, all those women were included in this study, so we didn't have any uh, dropouts per se, if I'm understanding your question correctly. Well, but I'm there were obviously I'm quite there curious how many women were operated in total and who were not in the study because oh this yeah could be a selection bias oh in that terms yeah okay so there are clinics that had a I don't have the exact numbers here but there were clinics that had response rates up until ninety percent some around eighty percent and I like I said we set the limit for seventy five percent so maximum uh, dropout is twenty five percent for the ICAQ. Hi, in Glavin, Denmark. Um, I think it's important to state that your follow-up was after three months. Absolutely. And uh, we did. Al we also did a study uh, on our own patients, uh, and uh, we did a follow-up. So actually, the numbers are even nicer if you do a follow-up. So I think that's also important. And you're so mind. right, Kain. The Duca base has a limitation. We do have the post-op follow-up for three months and no more. So I do expect nicer results, just like you got in your team, yes. I found your study, you mentioned about many preoperative SUI are cured after pap surgery, right? So you did not support the concomitant mini-resource mini surgery, surgery? No concomitant urinary incontinence surgery, is that your question? So you support stage or concomitant uh, TOT, such like that? 
I'm so I mean, uh, your patient have pub, yes. pub and uh, SUI. And, and urinary incontinence, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. So which method you will do for the patient? Only pub surgery or concomitant with it? Uh, as I stated before, no concomitant incontinence surgery was performed uh, in these patients. In Denmark in general, we very rarely uh, perform concomitant incontinence surgery. We're more conservative and we do the two-step approach where the women come in for pop surgery first, we evaluate them, see how it goes, and then first line of treatment is conservative treatment. So my, my patient complain about it, it cause her uh, incontinence after surgery? So if they have complaints of incontinence after pop surgery, we evaluate them and we treat them as any other patient with incontinence. Uh, conservative treatment first, and if she likes further on surgery. And I know, uh, I mean, there's a Dutch study some years ago looking into numbers needed to treat to avoid that one woman from needing a sling later on, and I believe the numbers needed to treat was 10. Um, so yes, we do conservative treatment first. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I just had one question. If you could um, hypothesize for us, why do you think urgency and continence gets better? Um, I was, I don't, I mean, I'm thinking if the anterior compartment is involved, I can relate to that maybe being some sort of irritative thing in that woman who has urgency urinary incontinence, but not, not all of them become continent. And I've been looking into the, the association between urinary incontinence and prolapse for years before, and if I could give you the answer, I really would. Um, I, I think we don't understand everything. Um, when it comes to pop and urinary incontinence? That's the short answer. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Yasmin. Thank, thank you. you.